welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of 1% Better and this one, I'm confident it's going to be a very interesting one, probably selfishly interesting, but I'm, I'm sure the conversation and my guests' insights will be very interesting to folks in lots of different areas of uh, their lives, I suppose, from a sporting perspective, but also from a, a corporate, from a professional perspective as well. I'm talking with Dan Abrahams. He's a sports psychologist, author, blogger, podcaster. We had a bit of a conversation about podcasting offline, and uh, I'm hoping to help him <laughs> up that one up. Um, but former professional golfer as well. And from following you for a while now on Twitter, Dan, I, I'm very interested and intrigued by your level of curiosity, your passion for learning, development, personal growth, all of those things. So looking forward to having this conversation. I hope that intro does you justice. Well, Rob, I'm absolutely delighted to be invited onto the show. So it's it certainly does. It certainly does. I'm I'm really looking forward to having the chat. Brilliant. So I think what I might start with is I noticed one of your tweets about maybe a month ago. I think when we connected, or inter interfaced with each other properly, and you mentioned mm. about one percent better. I think was the a, a, a tweet you would put out, and you had something referring to this mindset of being one percent better. And as the show was obviously called that. I think there's a great link to it. So is that something you believe in, in a mindset of kind of incremental improvement? Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that, I mean, as you mentioned in the, intro, in the introduction, I'm a sports psychologist. So um, I'm predominantly working with sports people. Uh, in fact, I would say 99% of my work is with sports people and the support staff around those sports people. And, and really, the realistic proposition uh, for sports competitors is to help them um, find their nudges, find the small increments of improvement, especially at the adult elite level. Um, so especially, at, I suppose, by that, I mean the very, very top level. You're not going to find big 10% and 20% shifts. If you are, you're going to turn your pretty good uh, professional footballer, if you like, into Lionel Messi. I mean, that mm -hmm. that would be that kind of shift. So really, you're just helping that player find those small air, small increments of improvement. And there's so many ways to do that. And that, that can start with self-skills, you know, self-awareness, uh, self-reflection, um, through to mental skills training, through to um, developing uh, personality characteristics, uh, developing life skills. Um, so there's a whole raft. And then as a sports psychologist, you can also aid a competitor's, competitor's improvement from a technical, tactical and physical perspective because you can help them set up a goal setting process. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a whole raft of things to do. But I, I, I am a big believer that I suppose I describe myself as the, the one to five guy. By that, I mean the 1% to 5% guy. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, as a sports psychologist, really in row Z. I'm not, I'm not the coach. I'm not the player, him or herself. So there's not, I, I can't make enormous shifts, but I can make very subtle shifts. And when you add up all those subtle shifts, then that can lead to quite uh, substantial um, leaps in, uh, in change, in performance improvement, in development. Um, but it really is a whole... It, it, it's it, it's a few one percent adding up mm, mm, interesting and when you're i suppose working with the professionals and maybe explaining that one percent mindset do you find a lot of the time that it takes them a while to buy into it do they want that 10 percent? and and maybe are their expectations sometimes too high or how do you work with kind of making the expectations more realistic maybe yeah i i, I think that I suppose there's always a big part of us that wants things to come easy. Basically, we, we want to say, yeah, you know, I, I can't, what's the what's the big thing that I can improve upon that's going to make a massive impact on my game? And really, again, at that professional level, that doesn't exist. You know, it, it's going to be a small thing. It's going to be a conglomerate, a cocktail of small things. Uh, does that take much persuading? I don't think it does. I, I think these days, whether you're talking about now, I'm, I'm, 
I'm, I'm aware that you're in Ireland there. So if you might be talking about Irish rugby or you might be talking about um, GAA or you might be talking, which I, I understand and recognise as an amateur sport still, but mm-hmm. you might be talking about uh, the brilliant Irish golfers sure. out there. You know, I, I think that they recognise that competition is such that um, they do have to explore those small things that are going to add up. You know, so 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 that's no problem at all, mm-hmm. and 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 so how they go about doing that? Well, you know, I think most of them these days are are pretty open minded to sports psychology. Um, mm-hmm. So it almost comp- competition itself forces their hand. They 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 have to go and explore this area. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it's, okay. it's not usually a hard sell. They're, they're on board with it. You mentioned golf in, in, in the intro. I know you were a pro golfer yourself. When you were growing up, what was your ambition? Because I'm guessing the passion you have for, for all of this sports psychology area, learning just psychology in general, was probably something that was, was always there. Would, would that be a, a leap of a guess to make? Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, I'm somebody who announced to my parents when I was 18 years old that I was leaving school and after my exams and I was going to be the best golfer in the world mm. and I probably failed miserably at that but uh, okay look I gave it a go and got nowhere near it um and uh but that was great I I, I wasn't that academic at school actually I didn't really enjoy school um but what I did enjoy was once I'd left school getting up early going to the golf club I was a scratch golfer so mm-hmm. I was okay being a scratch golfer doesn't mean you're a great golfer, you know, your Irish national team players are going to be plus three, plus four, plus five. So the amateur golfers, the best amateurs in Ireland, the best amateurs in England. I was lead psychologist for England golf in 2013 to 2016. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm fairly well acquainted with how good you've got to be. And, and they're good, you know, as I say, handicaps. For those who know the handicap system, it goes five, four, three, two, one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. So, they're, you know, they're anywhere between plus four and plus six by and large. And then they're turning professional. Right. Um, so I was a scratch handicap golfer and so I was okay, but I, I loved getting up and working at my game. Um, and then I realized I wasn't quite going to be quite good enough to compete with the very best. And a, a big portion, uh, a big reason behind that was because of what was going on between my two ears, I would stand on the first tee and I would see the rough, the trees, the bunker, the, 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 the wind, I would look at my plane partners and I would think how good their swing is and how bad mine is, even mm-hmm. though that wasn't actually in reality true. Um, and so I, 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 I became quite passionate about the psychological side of sport. And when I started coaching the game, that uh, interest uh, furthered, really. Uh, And so I found myself going to university at uh, a later age, in my sort of mid-20s, and completing a degree in psychology and and sports psychology. So I'd always been quite competitive um, as a kid growing up, and and then I became a professional sports person. So that was a natural – that competitiveness grew. Um, but now being a sports psychologist, I realized that competitiveness is, isn't often what we believe it to be. It's often uh, far more subtle than just come on guys, let's, you know, come and let's get stuck in. It's, it's, it's not really like, it's not really like that. And so often it's performance is quite paradoxical. Often less is more and being relaxed allows you to play at the right intensity and uh, allows you to be focused, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the kind of stuff, things I'm sure we'll go on and speak about. But um, yeah, I certainly was a competitor, that's for sure. Mm, very, very interesting. And I guess when you started to learn a little bit more about the mindset and mm. what was going on between your ears as a golfer, but but did you try to apply that to yourself then? Did you notice the incremental improvements or was it a case, and this is probably a bigger question for you, is there a certain level that talent just comes into play and there's this natural ability. That's probably a debate that goes on a lot, I'd imagine. The old nature nurture debate, and I think the reality of it, if the, if there is a truth, and um, it, this is a, a, as you say, is a real debate. If there is a truth, it's very much from the nurtured nurtured nature is probably the best uh, um, term you can come up with, um, or the most accurate one. Nurtured nature. And I, I think um, – so, I, look, I, I, I think that if you if you have ability and you work hard at what you're doing and you work properly, then you um, can give yourself a great chance to explore um, just how good you can be. Um, and I, th- I think for – 
for myself, when I reflect back, um, I didn't get the most out of my ability, even when I started to explore the psychological side, simply because I just, I kept asking why, why do I feel like this? Why am I experiencing these emotions? Why do I think this way? And in many respects, there is an element of when you're the gladiator in the arena, it's actually to the detriment uh, of your uh, capacity to compete um, when you start thinking that way, when you overanalyze. And that's not to say that competitors shouldn't analyze. I'm not a big believer of just blank your mind and play and just don't think about it too much um, because there's examples from every sport where you've got real students of the game becoming the best competitors, the best players in the world mm -hmm. at their sport. So please don't get me wrong. But I do think I was slightly too engulfed in reading the latest sports psychology book um, and trying to apply those things and juggling things around and and messing about with my swing and things like that that probably was to the detriment of my ability to compete. Um, I was also quite, when I reflect back, I was quite what we would call in psychology trait anxious from a physical perspective. It's, it's a very interesting phenomenon, you know, Rob. I mean, I stick me in front of a, a bunch of 100, 500, 1,000 coaches in the room, and mm. I love it. I love talking about this stuff, mm. um, not because I love my own voice, but just because I'm so passionate about it, and mm. I'm really interested and engaged, and I like, I like to learn from others. Um, if you stick me in front of 10 people with a golf club in my hand, I was terrified, uh, to put it as politely as I can. Mm. And I could be practicing for eight hours a day and then put me on the first tee, as I say, with 10 people watching me. And suddenly just my nervous system changed. Mm. And so uh, when I reflect back, that probably means that I didn't practice uh, well enough. I didn't use uh, a good enough rep what we would now call representational learning design. So I needed to put in more consequence into my practice. You know, I needed to ha have that old, you know, here's a game, here's a challenge. If I don't uh, succeed in this challenge, then I've got to give someone a hundred quid to put it crassly, or I've got to wash my dad's car or something like that, you know, a consequence mm. that would actually get my nervous system um, going so that I could learn to I could learn to manage that trait anxiety. I could learn to manage that. Um, and I say trait rather than state because I, I think I was quite a nervous individual back then um, mm. as a young adult in my early 20s. So I, I, I think that was very much to the detriment of my golf. Mm. Um, so uh, I certainly could have been better at applying what I was learning back then. Mm. Um and I would say now I'm probably not that great at applying it for myself in my golf and not that I play that much anymore. I'm probably better at applying it in my everyday life. Mm. Um, but I certainly do wish I knew then what I do now because I would have been a better golfer. I would have had more fun. I would have won more money. I would not have been Tiger Woods. So on the whole nature nurture uh, thing, there's certainly – sorry, I know I'm jumping all over the place no, here, but there's, there's certainly – there's certainly an element of, I, I, you know what, Sergio Garcia, if we're going to stick with the world of golf, Sergio Garcia is always somebody that comes to mind when I talk about this stuff. Mm. There's a player, there's somebody who's got so much skill in his hands that to a certain degree, he could be thinking pretty ropely on the golf course and still do pretty well. Mm. It was just that for so long when he came to the majors, I mean, the guy who had the voodoo over him was Padraig Harrington, your mm. fellow countryman. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it was just that when it came to the majors, you know, someone like Podrick would think really well and Sergio wouldn't. And mm. it would actually actually be to the detriment of Sergio's golf. Mm. In a normal tour event, Sergio just had so much skill in his hands that he just got away with it. There are definitely people who have so much skill in their hands or their feet that they get away with poor thinking. Mm. So there is an element of, you know, the reality is that some people are just really good at golf or really good at tennis or really good at football. Mm. or really good at uh, whatever sport that that's just they're really good at athletics mm. they're really quick and that's just the way it is mm. however if you do want to be one of the best in the world you are probably going to have to explore this side of things mm. and certainly if you want to be the very best that you can be whatever that looks like you're probably going to have to explore this side of things 
Mm. Does that make sense? It, no, it absolutely does. A couple of things came up for me there. One was it just you brought me back to the age of 11 when I used to play a lot of snooker. And when I played a little bit competitively in tournaments, when I got to semi-final or final stages, I would crumble under the kind of the pressure or the nervousness of there might be a trophy on the line or money on the line. And I always knew that there was a, a nervous element. So I think that's probably what your the, the trait anxiety piece came in there. You're familiar with the term flooding in, in psychology, almost where you're similar to maybe what you were saying, that putting every time you played on the line for, for, for some sort of consequences. Would that be a similar sort of mindset there to kind of put yourself in that situation as much as possible to get that nervous system used to it almost? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, again, I would, I would let me explain how I would do this with a. Again, I know we're sticking to golf here, but it, 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 it's a good sport to talk about for this stuff, and mm-hmm. it sort of correlates with the business world as well because mm-hmm. it's quite self-paced. And so, how I would work with golfers is, I would talk to them. A, it, it, it's several ways here. It's, it's firstly practice. How do you practice? And traditionally, what we've done in golf, and traditionally what I suppose people do in all sports is it's like okay work really hard work really hard in golf it's hit lots of golf balls practice all day long and look there is an element of you've got to work hard nobody denies that nobody i don't think anybody would want to to change that maxim that's important but it's the quality of your practice and this term representational learning design is really really important so what do i mean by that so when you practice and you just beat balls you're just hitting ball after ball after ball mm. that doesn't look like the game That doesn't look like the game of golf. The game of golf is you're hitting shots every, say, four or five minutes. You're hitting different clubs, different types of shots, different demands. Your perceptual, uh, motor perceptual system is seeing different things and feeling different shots. So so what I would do with a golfer is, uh, is I would talk in terms of four levels. So level one would be technical practice. And that could be, as I've just explained, just um bringing in a ball hitting lots and lots of shots just working on your technique level two would be um bringing in a routine so you're hitting goal shots working on your technique and working on your routine so you've got a routine and technique level three would be adding in a game um so having an objective you know, so from a basic game might be creating a fairway and trying to hit X amount on the fairway. That would be a very basic game. Um, a bit more variability and variability is a, is a really important word here might be, you know, you might be hitting three iron, six iron, eight iron, um, alternatively, and you've got to hit different targets, but you've still got, you're still working on your technique and you're still working on your routine and there's a game that would be level three. So you're starting to create more of a representational learning design and then level four is this nervous system scenario let's create the kind of nervous system that you you might experience on the golf course under pressure so there's got to be a consequence there Mm -hmm. the big question is what is the consequence you know i mean if i if i said to most guys and the way i talk about it is if i by and large unless you're working with a very very top golfer who's a multi-millionaire mm-hmm. if you say to a golfer look we're going to play the game here and if you lose this game if i said to you you've got to give me ten thousand pounds that is going to fire your nervous system you're going to start to release your stress hormone cortisol mm-hmm. a plenty right mm-hmm. that's going to flood your your bloodstream and you're going to be pretty nervous so you're really that's going to be like playing in a top event and being in contention mm-hmm. um the reality is there's not many golfers who are willing to do that for £10,000. So, so then we'll come down monetary-wise. Right. Or I worked with a, a tour player um, who won the South African Open a couple of years ago. Really nice guy, really good tour player. And we'd been working for a few years. And one of the tasks uh, uh, he set himself, and this was, this was him, was over the winter, because the South African Open was in January. Mm-hmm. And over the winter, he um, the consequence he created was to do – he practiced uh, on a driving range in Florida, a very busy driving range. And consequence enough was, for him was if he didn't achieve what he set out to achieve, he would do 10 press-ups in the middle of the range. And he's quite a shy guy. And so actually his nervous system would fire at the thought of this because right. he felt he was looking a bit foolish doing mm-hmm. this uh, in in the middle of this – busy range and actually it really helped him because he actually got to practice under the conditions that he would experience the personal conditions that he would experience this this anxiety uh, these nerves um and so he started to learn how to manage himself better through these nerves 
and so and and so that's what that's you use the term flooding yeah i mean that that that's what it would it would look like essentially and you can do that that kind of thing in all sports so that's mm. so that's really the first answer uh, the second answer you can do that and players still might not get better and the reason why they might not get better is because actually when they get into competition they don't have a, a solid mental framework in which to um in which they try to execute i'm a big believer that sports competitors need a mental framework when they go and compete and i'm a big believer that competitors um at all levels need this so if you're listening to this and you're an amateur sports competitor and amateur sports competitors take their sport seriously by and large by and large they do Mm -hmm. they want to do well and what i would say to you if you're an amateur sports competitor is you'll you 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 will do a lot better if you have a framework to the mental side of your game. So by that, I mean, if you have specific objectives around the mental side of the game that you can focus on, that you can go and execute, and then you can reflect upon, did I execute these mental techniques? Mm. Um, Because you know what? The, The amazing thing, Rob, is by and large, when you sit down with professional tennis players, golfers, footballers, rugby players, and you ask them, you're going and you're going you're going to compete on Saturday. What are you trying to achieve mentally? By and large, by and large, very few are are unable to tell you what they're trying to com- what they're trying to achieve mentally. Mm. By and large, they're not very f- they'll say I want to win and they'll say I want to perform really well and they may be able, able to articulate the role and the responsibilities within their role, but they're not necessarily that great at articulating what they want to achieve mentally, what is going to help them self-manage in the moment under pressure. Mm. And I'm aware that this is very much a, a business podcast as well. And, and, and I would say the same thing to your audience with regard their meetings, their presentations, their per- the performance moments that you have in your workplace. What are those performance moments? And do you have a specific mental framework to be able to deal with those performance moments? Mm. That to me is so important. And that, it, it, that might be the sales call. It might be the sales meeting. It might be uh, a, a difficult conversation. It might be a meeting with your, with your staff, with your team. Um, you might have, uh, you, you, you might have a series of steps in terms of what you want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, you might have your, your the series of steps with regard to what you want to get across, but do you have a mental framework that's going to help you to be able to function effectively, function, perform optimally in that moment? Mm-hmm. That would be my question mark there, because mm-hmm. um, that's so important in sport. And, and I want to get across that, hey, look, 99% of my work is in sport, so I'm not as fluent as you are with, say, in the business world. But I would imagine it's very, very similar. It's what are my performance moments? Mm. Do I have a psychological framework that helps me deal with the challenges of that performance uh, performance moment? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the the term mental models is would that, would you would you kind of put that in the same sort of bracket as the mental framework that you're you're talking about? Are you familiar? You're familiar, I presume, with mental models. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think these semantics can be important so mm. i think and i think these terms can be used interchangeably and sometimes when we use them interchangeably we're we're coming from different directions so when you say mental yeah. model I how be, are you defining that I what do you mean look at mental models and, and maybe looking at it from a from a work business environment if if for example there's a, a big presentation or there's a big meeting coming up and there's an element of vi- virtual or visualization during this as well. So I know this is coming. I know some of the, the questions that might be asked and almost preempting what they might be, the different directions this could go in and then preparing myself accordingly so that I'm able to answer those questions and take it down that route. Or if I know this question might come up, I can then predict the answer and know where I could lead it thereafter. So you're kind of walking yourself through that high pressure environment for a period of time so that when it does come around, you feel more prepared. You've been here before. You can actually deal with it in that moment. That, that's kind of the, 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 the angle I would look at it. Would that resonate? Yeah. And I, and I absolutely. And I think maybe. When I'm talking about a fr- mental framework, I, I, I'm almost getting <laughs> putting my 
psychologist cap on here i'm almost getting into a bit more into the nitty-gritty i love what you've just said and and that seems like a sort of a a, a really effective classical traditional approach to optimize your capacity to uh function in that meeting if you like to get across what you want to get across and answer any questions and deal with uh tough moments if you like uh challenging situations i i also think that it's um how do i optimize my psychology in that moment how do i portray myself with confidence how do i continue to portray myself with confidence if the meeting isn't going so well how do i continue to pay attention to the right things what is the right intensity level here Mm. um how do i get myself how do i deliver with positive intent you see, the interesting thing is here, and then this is more of a, a conversation, I suppose, than an interview, because <laughs> I think it's interesting to get your point of view. No, I think it's interesting because when I stand by the side of a Premier League football pitch, so for instance, I do a day a week at the moment with Bournemouth, but over the last mm-hmm. 15 years, I've worked with a number of Premier League clubs. When I was involved with England rugby last year, and I was standing by the rugby pitch, not far from Eddie Jones and his gang. When I've stood by the golf range, when I've stood by the tennis court, I do a bit for doing a bit for the LTA, the Lawn Tennis Association at the moment. There were three key mental skills that I'm essentially looking at that sum up what I would describe as a high performance mindset. Mm-hmm. Those three key mental skills are attention. So the, uh, the ability to pay attention and the ability to manage distractions. But I would put that under the umbrella term of attention. Mm-hmm. Intensity. And in sports psychology terms, the psychological term would be activation or the horrible term of arousal. Let's park arousal. Um, but let's use the term activation, right? But more of a layperson's term is intensity. Mm-hmm. So what are are the players competing at the right intensity? Are they over are they too intense here? Are they running around like headless chickens? Mm. So that you're not going to do that in a business meeting, are you? But you, you can probably get too have too much intensity. So you can be hostile, mm-hmm. uh, for mm-hmm. example. You could be frustrated, for example, or you could come under the activation levels. So you could be under aroused, so to speak. So you could be despondent or down. Uh, you could be deflated in the moment. Mm-hmm. So I would imagine intensity is still a thing as well. And then the final um, the final mental skill is positive intent. Intent. And that's very much related to the classic challenge versus threat response. Am mm-hmm. I in a challenge response here? So am I in a good frame of mind where I'm delivering what I want to deliver with positive intent? So in sporting terms, am I executing with positive intent? Am I executing every action, every motion, every movement with positive intent? In the business world, that's going to be slightly different, isn't it? Isn't it? In a meeting, is am I am I getting myself across with positive intent? Are my gestures positive? Am I am I looking at the person in the eye? Am I am I am I am I delivering with empathy or am I are my listening skills? executed with intent i suppose yeah. and again you can help me here but yeah. um uh th- that's those are the three skills mm. in my opinion you speak to us another sports psychologist and you'll go oh no well i see it this way mm. but if we're talking about individual mental skills it's attention intensity intent when players get that right in the moment they to me are in their high performance mindset. So my job as a sports psychologist is to introduce the kind of techniques, and we can go on to talk about Mm -hmm. this, introduce techniques that help them pay attention, that help them execute with the right intensity, that help them deliver with positive intent. And I would say to your audience, if you can, in your own, in your business world, Mm. whatever that looks like, public sector, private sector, whatever, what does that look like to you? Attention, intensity, intent and you you the audience listening would be the expert in whatever domain that you you know you work in but what do those three things mean to you that to me when you optimize those three things that's your high performance mindset Mm, brilliant yeah no i i definitely can draw parallels to pretty much all of those and 
I'm trying to put myself in, you know, in a meeting sort of scenario when when you're talking about that. And with the positive intent one, for example, there is an element where you could be over gesticulating almost too positively. And for, for some reason, the word authenticity came into my mind there as well, because you, you want to try and be authentic as as well in, in that moment. And I don't know how that would translate to a tennis player in, in trying to be in high performance, but is authenticity a consequence of those three or is it, it's probably, is it something that it would even consider in that moment? See, the thing I love about these conversations is, uh, and, and obviously you're acquainted with the uh, sporting world, but you're very well acquainted with the business world is that, you know, when you say certain words and you're on the other end, we go you're acquainted with the business world. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, no. And I, what I was actually going to say was almost the opposite is in as much as you say authenticity. And I'm like, absolutely, Rob. Yeah, this is massive, massive in sport. Because really, in in my opinion, uh, in the sporting world, it is a, it is a keen balance. There's a sweet spot between inauthenticity or being inauthentic and and authenticity. That's really, really important in my opinion. It, it, it's neither one nor t'other. It's both. And and here's the thing is if you get those mental skills right, yeah, you might be being authentic, but also there's times to be inauthentic. Mm-hmm. You know, there's times and, – and, and let me let me explain this a bit closer. And I'll, the way I can explain this is is actually to talk to you a bit about a technique that I've – I actually wrote about in – I've written about in my books, especially my my – fourth book actually soccer tough Mm too um and and it's called a game face um and i suppose in footballing circles um if 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 i am known for anything and hopefully i'm 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 that it's positive but if i'm known it's 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 known for this technique of game face and um and it's a combination game face is your personality, the personality you want to have as you compete. It's who you want to be. Right. It's how you want to go about your business. Mm. It's, it's, when I say who you want to be, it's the embodiment of who you want to be. And it's built for memory, imagination, and perception. And that's really where the authenticity and the in, in, inauthentic mm of this balances out memory imagination and perception so let me just explain that so when i sit down with a player so let, let let's use football this time as an example but it could be rugby as well because i know how big rugby is in ireland um if i sit down with a footballer uh, i'll ask them about their very best game i'll ask them about their very best game so i'll, I'll get them to tap into their memory and this is really important for business people as well. I think going into meetings is what are you? What does what does your best look like when you're at your best in that performance environment? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What do other people see? And so what I'll do is, and I'll also ask, I'll ask players to tap into their imagination as well. Not just your best game, but also your dream game. What does your dream? What does your dream meeting look like? What does your dream sales pitch look like? What does your dream game look like? Um, so, so that might be, add a bit of inauthenticity as well. You know, what does not just ten out of ten look like, but what eleven out of ten or twelve out of ten? What does it go, look like when it's going amazingly well? Mm. So, so, and and then you're trying to elicit key words from players. So I'll I'll start to we'll start to talk about well is it alert alive relentless dominant upbeat cool calm relaxed and so what you'll get from players is you'll get a mix of authenticity and inauthenticity you'll get somebody saying well Dan when I'm at my best I'm confident I'm confident you know well tell me what confident looks like so they'll talk a bit about you know being confident I'm tall I'm decisive I'm making these runs I'm doing it confidently can you see yourself do that yeah I can picture that yeah I can see myself do that Mm. yeah okay right all right what does your dream game look like wow I'm just more relentless when I'm in my dream game I'm more relentless you know I'm I'm ridiculously relentless I'm you know I'm I'm non-stop essentially and I might stand still but I'm I'm kind of relentlessly standing still, if that makes sense. And and and, and so quite confident, relentless, great, fantastic. Okay. And and then we might play with this image. We might create a pictorial metaphor around: is there a is there a model player that 
that um, that when you think about being confident, relentless, kind of sums this up. And this player might say, "Well, I'm a midfielder, and you know, Lionel Messi as a to to, to use a cliched player, right? And so confident, relentless, Messi." Or actually, you might use an animal, for example. So somebody, you might say, well, is there, does this remind you of an animal? And uh, they might say, oh, a lion. Oh, confident, relentless lion. Confident, relentless lion. Right, great. Mm. Confident, relentless lion. Right, your job on the pitch is to be confident, relentless lion. Confident, relentless lion. And really, that's a mix of uh, an authentic, this is who I am, at, I am when I'm at my best. So this is my memory of me at my best. But this is a, a bit of an inauthenticity as well. This is like, I've got to be a great actor out there as well. Mm. So if I feel despondent or I feel flat or I feel frustrated or I feel down or I feel anxious or I feel worried or I feel doubting or I feel self-conscious, all of these human things that tend to happen to us because of our biology – then I have to get back to, as an example, confident, relentless lion. Now, actually, it just so happens that the confident, the relentless lion happened to be a striker I'm working with who's probably worth about 25 and 30 million pounds on the transfer market. That's not to impress anybody. It's just to impress, impress upon you that yeah. a game face is something that even a very a, a top sports person can work on. I actually worked, I remember working with a... a, a um, an Irish striker years ago he played for Ireland and he played in Scotland and uh, he came up with dominant greyhound. How good was that? I actually wrote about it in my first book, Soccer Tough, dominant greyhound, dominant greyhound. Cause he said to me, Dan, when I'm at my best, I'm dominant. And he had a bit of a chuckle when we talked about the, um, uh, a bit of an embarrassed sort of chuckle at the uh, animal idea, but he got it. And he said, you know, I'm a greyhound. Why? Because a greyhound is constantly annoying people. You know, it's all constantly nipping at you. And that's how I want to be at the pitch on the pitch. I want to be annoying for the center backs mm. because that's how our brain, our brain works in metaphors, right. you know, and there's great work by in the early eighties by a cognitive linguist called George Lakoff on this um, metaphors. Really, really important work. Really important work. Um, and um, so we, we, we tend to function in metaphors. Uh, and so dominant greyhound, dominant greyhound. How do I want to be in the meeting? I want to be confident and dominant. Now, that might be the wrong. That might be wrong for you, you know, but no, no. I, I, I want to be confident and upbeat. But you've got to elicit it from the person in front of you. Mm. It's got to come from their world. That's really important. You can suggest words, but for anybody listening in, what action-based words represent who you want? It's a, it's a visual representation of who you want to be. Mm. It's the embodiment. But embodiment, Rob, is a really important word here. Because for me, mate, this is where a lot of people get psychology wrong. And I'm gonna I'm gonna use another funky psychological term here, embodied cognition. Embodied cognition. So by that I mean the embodiment of your cognition. So your perceptual processes, your memory, your imagination, your thinking. What we now believe in psychology, or what a lot of psychologists have now started to study and research, is this notion that cognition is dispersed through your body. The experience you have of living and moving and functioning in your body make a big difference to how you perceive things, mm -hmm. how you feel in the moment. So it's to me, it's very important for a footballer, for example, to walk onto the pitch in the style of their game face, for example, in the style of confident, relentless lion, for them to hold themselves this way, to act this way, to be this, to do this. Mm. That is embodiment, be, do and act. And I would hypothesize that that would be a really useful thing for a business person to do under pressure in the moment. Who do I want to be? Maybe I want to be um, um, sharp, upbeat, confident, for instance. Sharp, upbeat. It wouldn't be physically sharp, but it might be mentally sharp. Mm -hmm. Hold yourself sharp, upbeat, confident. Don't just say it, but be it and do it and act it. And it's the embodiment of, 
that helps you um that helps you optimize your mentality in the moment and optimize your capacity to perform in that moment very very interesting i'll throw another couple of words at you that might bring you in another direction there Inter- introvert and extrovert so how does that tie in with you know with the players with, with your experience in golf and football because i guess if you know from an untrained eye you might look at it on the pitch and you might think most of those players that are top performers might be naturally extroverted i would imagine if to your terms there of the you know the the uh, dominant lion or the they're probably again being inauthentic to get out of maybe some of that introversion so just maybe talk to me about whatever comes up from that Mm. Uh, what comes up from that? Wow. Um, personality. That sounds like a coaching the question five. there. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, the, 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 well, the big five, the big five, you know, openness, conscientiousness, um, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And, and I, I think obviously you've talked about the introversion, extroversion, the extroversion dimension. And you know what I, I, I find very interesting, Rob, is I, I would actually say that, so if, we, if we're talking, if we're talking about the game face, um, I would say we're talking more about the agreeableness dimension. Um, I think people who tend to be high agreeable tend to be tend to be less competitive. Um, people who uh, are naturally or more inclined to be more friendly in, in given environments tend to be less competitive. You know, if you think of somebody like Roy Keane, who a fellow Irishman um, who was renowned for being competitive, um, he talked about uh, he's actually in a in quite a good interview you can watch on YouTube, uh, and he's being interviewed about his, his relationship with Alex Ferguson mm-hmm. and his attitude and temperament on the pitch, and he talked about. Uh, it being an act, it's an act, it's an act. And in my world, that well, that's a game face. Yeah. But you're talking about someone who's very low agreeable. You know, he when he gets into the environment he's got to be in, he's a very, very low agreeable person. So in sports, and I'm talking about sport here, you have to be quite low agreeable. You can't be high agreeable when you're on the pitch or the course or the course. Mm. So, so really, a game face is about getting competitive, being focused, um, um, having the capacity to compete, essentially. Does a game face tap into extroversion? Uh, maybe, possibly. Um, I think it lowers your neuroticism. It helps you be more emotionally stable. I think introversion, extroversion is an interesting scale. I think that sociability is as shyness is as much to do with neuroticism or more to do with neuroticism than it is to do with introversion. I think that's where people get this wrong slightly. Um, So I I would say that a game face and mental skills are designed more to help you be more emotionally stable, so less neurotic, um, more than anything else. I think that you can still compete very very nicely perform very nicely whilst being an introvert i wouldn't say the in my experience the introversion extroversion scale in sport anyway proves a stumbling block in terms of your capacity your capacity capacity to compete Mm. the interesting question there is does introversion extroversion mediate leadership yeah and i suppose you know you might think it does but some of the best leaders in sport are quite uh, introverted. So mm. they get their energy from within rather than from um, the environment. And what a lot of studies would show from a leadership perspective is some of the best leaders are the ones who aren't shouting and screaming and raising blue murder in the changing room before the game, they're actually getting in amongst their, their their teammates and they're having small conversations. They're reminding, they're reinforcing, they're subtly cajoling, they're uh, patting on the back, mm. they're raising spirit by quiet reminders, they're whispering a lot of the time. Mm. And that's not the only way to lead, clearly. Sure. But that evidence does suggest that introverts, if we're going to use that term, 
can be great leaders. Um, so, so, so I, I think that's that's important to to, to say as well. Okay. Um, just just on on the topic of leadership, uh, one of the things I research in and look at is this concept of situational leadership, where you're leading in obviously putting yourself in different situations so if you're and this one probably is more towards a, a team right in historically you might have you know heard the whole alex ferguson hair dryer treatment and he kind of leads the same way with every player on the on the on the pitch on the team maybe um, maybe in this new environment you know you might lose the dressing room if you act that way and it's very difficult to get them back or whatever in your experience with with managers and coaches have you seen a, a change there do you coach coaches to lead in different situations and be aware of the different personality traits that are make up a team yes i i would i would say that using words such as transformational rather than transactional coaching stroke leadership is vital now i think using term like servant leadership uh, autonomy supportive coaching rather than controlled coaching um, these are the kind of buzz terms that are becoming more and more popular these days and they're becoming popular because they're becoming true um, that leadership and coaching if we were to attach those two together and I know they're not exactly the same but let's um, call them the same or similar um that it being individual specific now understanding the person behind the player underpinning the performer is becoming much more pertinent today and is that due to the millennial generation is that a shift i don't know i mean people will say that and they'll throw that out there and that may well be the case mm. Um, I think we're becoming wiser, where, whether, be, whether it's because the world's got smaller, because every part of every bit of information available on this planet is tucked into your pocket these days. Mm. Um, and so subsequently, you just do a basic Google search and you can become a better coach that way. Mm. And you can learn more about people and, 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 and players are becoming more demanding because of that. Um, that may well be the case. But look. I think that being player led, being person led is, is absolutely vital that coaches are starting to understand. You use the term personality that if you've got 25 players in a squad, you've got 25 different personalities. You've got 25 players with different needs, wants, hopes, doubts, beliefs, expectations, values, religions, cultures, experiences. And I could go on. Mm -hmm. And if you want to coach from a controlled coaching uh, autocratic perspective, by all means, go and do that. I don't think you're going to get very far. You're going to be have to be highly skilled, a highly skilled tactician to get away with it. And even then, I don't, I don't think you're going to get that far, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so I think your people skills these days have to be a lot better. If they're not, then you're, if you're a sports, uh, if you're a manager or a head coach, you're going to have to have assistants, assistant coaches who are extremely adept at those who make up for your lack of people skills, if you like. So I do think you have to accommodate different individuals. You can't tarnish everyone with the same brush. Um, I think that's vital. Mm. And, just one follow on just in relation to that is a culture almost or <laughs> of fear putting fear within your players to perform is that something you see anymore is that kind of died out a lot that that you know you might get the reaction you want if you're putting uh, the the fear of god in some of the players sort of thing I just don't think that yeah, I'd like to see some, if somebody feels that they can do that in sport, I'd like to see them do it these days. I, I just don't think you can. Mm. I think there's a, a wealth of complexity that underpins Sir Alex Ferguson's success. Uh, some people are successful for reasons 
that are out of the, the public domain, if you like. Um, I think there are other reasons for Sir Alex's success. I mean, I was very fortunate to work alongside Steve McLaren at Derby County for a season. And look, he did say, I mean, he said to me, and I know he wouldn't mind me saying this, that, that um, there was an element of that. But that was momentum built from the late 80s. And um, did he get away with it, Did you know, from the late 80s onwards? And he built that momentum. And so subsequently he could lead through fame. That may well be the case. I don't know. Uh, what I do know is this, Rob, and I think a far more pragmatic and effective way of putting it is like this, is that a coach has two dials, a support, uh, a stretch dial and a support dial. Let's get away from the word fear. Clearly, we want to stretch players. We need to stretch players. We need to stretch players in our activities, in our sessions. We need to stretch players through our communication. We need to set, help them set stretch goals. We need to stretch players by giving them the opportunity to work as holistically as possible. Physically, technically, tactically, mentally, nutrition-wise. That's how we stretch players. We stretch players in those areas. We don't stretch players by um, making them fearful within the coaching environment, in my opinion, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And then we support players. We support players by uh, putting the right processes in place through our communication um, by, um, as coaches, having the capacity to deliver mental skills, supporting in our environment, supporting them by turning down the volume of pressure within activities at times, and then turning up the volume of stretch at other times. So we've got these two dials, a support dial and a stretch dial. And I, you know what? I could, I could imagine that for any leader in a, in an organization, it could be useful to, you know, if you've got a team under you, that servant leadership um, approach and within that servant leadership approach, you know, it's, it's, it's how can I help you? Mm -hmm. How can I be of servitude, service to you? Is what I'm saying helping you feel great? Is what I'm saying helping you feel that you can function effectively within the team? How can I use my stretch dial? How can I stretch you? How can I support you? How can I use that support dial? And, I, I, and so I think it's the same in, in an organization in the business world as it would be in, in, in sport because that's very much how it works in sport. And a great example uh, would be, say, Gareth Southgate with the England football team. Now, I'm not on the inside there, and this is a bit of what I've heard and what's out there in the public domain. But also I work with players who are in the England team and have been in the England team, and and I've spoken to them about this. And it, it, it's, it feels very much that servant leadership from Gareth. Now, mm -hmm. it's going very well for the England team, the England football team at the moment, and I think we can come out with these stories of success. If it starts to go wrong, then, then we all come up with egg on our face and go, oh, well, servant leadership isn't what it was then or isn't what it is then. But I, I, I think that I think that it seems to me that at the moment they're striking the right chord there and, mm -hmm. and he's getting it right, and he's very much supporting the players rather than putting himself above the players and saying, I'm the boss, I'm the leader, you do what I say, which tends to be, historically has tended to be the classic leadership model in sport, that autocratic controlled model. Mm. It feels like he's actually placing himself under the players and saying, hey, you guys are the talent. Mm. What can I do here? to help you be better at what you do. What do you need from me? Hey, here's a few suggestions. Mm. Here's some ideas. Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't set the tactics. It doesn't mean, but he's getting input. Mm. He's getting ideas. He's getting solutions from the players. And I think that's probably very important in the business world as well. If you've got a team of seven people under you, 
you've probably therefore got 120, 150 years plus of experience under the under you. So why not utilize that? Mm-hmm. You know, you've got 10 or 20 or 30 years of experience. That that pales into insignificance as to that 150 years. Mm-hmm. So use people. Don't be scared to empower people to come up with the solutions. Mm. You know. No, I definitely agree. And, you know, I think there's an element of maybe a, you don't want to show a sign of weakness or, or show that you're not in control, but by giving up the control ultimately can, you know, give you even more uh, return on investment from, from that perspective. And I would say looking at your world and knowing that you're close to Bournemouth, I would imagine, Eddie, how does uh, something similar in his style from, you know, what you would see from afar yeah, well, I mean, I'm being very fortunate to work with some good coaches and I had a really fun year with England rugby and, and seeing Eddie Jones uh, uh, do something similar with, with England rugby. And I think it would be wrong of me to go into too much detail with regard with what I've experienced sure. from those guys without asking their permission. But I, I, I certainly know he's on record as, as being feeling like he can, you know, servant leadership is very important. Um, I mean, he's a very strong character. This I'm talking about Eddie Jones here and mm. he's a strong character and a, a willful character. And, and um, it's um, challenging to work uh, alongside him and under him. And, and, and I know that he stretches the players, uh, but he empowers the players to come up with their own solutions and um you know um and i get to watch eddie howe on the training ground this is at afc bournemouth and i and i see um you know some some real good passionate intense coaching and i see him ask questions of players um so there's there's different forms of coaching Mm. um and um i know that psychological side is something that eddie howe is very uh, uh passionate about Mm. So, yeah, their, their leadership models have, are, are quite similar. Very good. I'm conscious of time. We're hitting the hour mark, and I do want to give you some time back this evening, even though I probably could talk to you for about five hours. Um, I want to just touch on, on your books. You have four books, and I'm fascinated about the whole process of writing books. They happen as a, a very much planned uh part of your overall journey or, or did they just come out of some of the learnings i'd love to know a little bit about those and maybe talk a bit about just the, the key takeaways from them yeah look i um i back in sort of around 2011 i i sat down and i started to write i thought right am i am i capable of writing so i wrote an ebook which i still give away if you went on my website danabrahams.com it's a mental uh, toughness. I don't love using the term mental toughness anymore, but uh, mental toughness for for soccer ebook, mm-hmm. and it's free, and you can just sign up for it. And um, and um, I enjoyed writing it, and I had a few people say, "Oh, this is this is okay, this is okay." So I thought, okay, cool. Um, and so uh, I started to sit down, and I wrote my first. You know, from there I wrote a book, and that was my first published book, and that was Soccer Tough. And I really wanted to, probably the biggest influence in my psychological career or one of the biggest influences is a guy called Dr. Bob Rattella, who's an American sports psychologist who predominantly works in golf, but has worked, has worked across sports. And mm. He just, um, you know, I don't agree with everything that Dr. Dr. Rattella says, but uh, from a philosophical perspective, but he, um, the great thing about his books is that his first book, golf is not a game of perfect, which is well worth reading. Um, after you read my books, ha ha. Um, yeah, he, uh, no, I'm only joking. They're, they're brilliant books. And, and he, um, he, this book, Golf is Not a Game of Perfect, it was probably the first, probably, and I don't want to do anybody else a disservice here, but probably the first book to come along, first author, psychologist to come along to write a psychology, sports psychology book that really was very much demystified sports psychology and, and, and wrote in a very accessible style and didn't include any theory and wrote case studies, stories, stories, basically. I wouldn't even say case studies, just stories. And he obviously got permission from players to, to write about that. And, and I wanted to do the same in football. I thought, yeah, you know what? Hey, I could do this in football. So mm. I had permission from, you know, not you know, with the greatest of respect to whom I'm, I'm about to mention, um, you know, not is that not Javi or Messi or Iniesta, but you know, some good players, some really good Premier League players, Cotton Cole, 
mm-hmm. who um, I was fortunate enough, enough to work with, helping him go from sort of languishing in the West Ham reserve team to England international. And at that time, a, pl- uh, a young Irish player called Anthony Stokes, mm-hmm. who was the the player I alluded to earlier, yeah. um, and uh, a few others. And I got permission. They kindly gave permission for me to write about the work we'd done together a little bit, not everything, but the, right. the, the performance psychology side. And so it was really just about bringing it alive. And so I had chapters like how Carlton squashed his ants, ants being an acronym for automatic negative thoughts. <laughs> uh, Stokesy the Greyhound. Right. You know, I was in Anthony Stokes and being a dominant Greyhound. And um, how Richard, uh, uh, oh God, how Richard Keogh learnt to focus, right. Richard Keogh being a, a Derby County centre back. Mm-hmm. So I, I tried to just demystify it. So that was soccer tough, and that did okay. That was uh, a, a cheeky global bestseller, actually, Rob. So that that <laughs> nice. did, that did okay. That sold mm-hmm. a lot in the states and sold a bit in Ireland, and and then uh, I straight the next year I wrote my first coaching book, which was called Soccer Brain, right. um, and then I wrote. Um, my first golf book, which was golf tough. So I used the word tough again, golf tough. And then I wrote soccer tough too, um, which as the name suggests was a sequel to soccer tough. And I just, I just really enjoyed, it was just about demystifying this stuff. Hmm. You know, um, I was always conscious that I didn't want to get too far. I didn't want to take liberties and get too far away from theory. Mm-hmm. But it was like, let's demystify this, make this into stories um, and um, go from there, really. And people seem to quite like my writing style. Um, I try to make it punchy. Mm-hmm. I would listen to a collection of a combination of dance music like the prodigy to write it to random i know uh, but 80s music and mm. 90s sort of stuff and and i had to write to music because it got me oh. into the kind of mood that i wanted to write to so that Ooh. that was my process and that was it yeah so, oh, yeah. so that's so that's good and i've still I've, the next one is in the pipeline so i'm, I'm gonna do it soon very good. I'll definitely include links to all of those um, for sure. And I'm just fascinated. I did an ebook last year myself, so I'm kind of figured out that whole writing process just at, at an ebook mm-hmm. level, but haven't um, gone any further yet. It's it's. It, were you were you blocking out just interest in your kind of time management? How did you find time to do it? Did you get religious at getting up early in the morning? Were you just writing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like that. Got up early, uh, worked late. I did. I think I did have a period where I made the decision to not take up a few consultancy positions, right. and so I bravely said, "You know what? Let, let's invest for the future, and right. let's make a bit of a sacrifice now." So I didn't put myself out there much, and I just got on with the writing for a few years. Um, I was consulting, but I was doing a lot of writing at the time. So, and I was. At, it was just a time in my life where I was able to do that. So not, I realized not everybody has that luxury. Mm. So yeah, it's a case of getting up early or getting, being late and getting, staying up late and you just, you do it, you do it, you do it. You know, it's just the way it is. Very good. I'll, I'll ask the question I got from Twitter, uh, just to, to throw a bit of, uh, you know, sort of mix in there. Um, I put out a tweet beforehand. This one came from at Angela Harris HR. Uh, would love to hear Dan's thoughts on coming back from injury, a second ACL replacement and meniscus knee, uh, close brackets, and overcoming the fear of the repeat injury to, to trust your recovering body and ability. How do you kind of coach for that, the, the mental toughness there? Yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously a challenging time. I, I recently worked with a player who came back from his second ACL in a couple of years or three second one in three years so that's good sort of 18 months out in three years so it's a long time and he's actually an international player he's he's a, he's a fairly well-known footballer but um and um a lot of what we did was you know there's a lot I could say here so I'll condense it but sure. a lot of what we did from a practical standpoint was actually we created a game face without him he didn't have the capacity to, capacity to go on the pitch and execute the game face but we talked about his dream game talked about his best game we got down some keywords we uh, and we and uh, and not just keywords but some we talked in depth about that best game and and we came up with a game face and um 
Um, and those those sort of inner images really drove daily visualization, just picturing those. And when he started to feel anxious, worried coming back, um, he would take the time just to um, manage how manage those thoughts. And there's different ways to do that. You can go with a classic thought stopping technique, or you could be a bit more acceptance commitment about that, um, and sort of just accept that you're going to have some negative thoughts, you're going to have some doubts and anxiety, and just say, "Hey, look, okay, I'm having some negative thoughts here. That's okay. That's all right." But then just gently shifting your mind onto that game face or your best games and start to rehearse those. And you can do that just by asking yourself a question. Okay, look, I'm having some negative thoughts. That's okay. That's natural right now. Right. When I come back, what will it look like if I train in the style of my game face, in the style of my keywords? What does my best game look like? What does it feel like? And those questions can start to drive a conversation with yourself or driving in a movie, if you like, of your best games and, coming back and training in the style of your game face and stuff. So just you being the director of your focus of attention rather than allowing the, your biology to direct your focus of attention, that, that stress and that anxiety of, you know, related to being injured. So that's, that's important. I think with your return to play, the one thing I would say, again, there's plenty that one can say, but the one thing I'd say when you do return to play is to have low expectations, not be too demanding on yourself from a performance perspective, but to place expectation demands from a mental perspective. And again, we can that, that's the beauty of working on your game face mentally in your timeout. It, then you can start to demand from yourself, okay, you know, let, let's just say you're, your game face is confident, relentless lion. Um, what I demand for myself, what I ask for myself, demand is maybe a strong word, but what I ask for myself, what I expect for myself is to strive my best to be confident, relentless lion out there. I'm going to be it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to act it. That might mean that because of my injury, I might be three out of 10 or four out of 10 for my performance. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's all right. I think it's really important to be accepting of your performance. Right. Not be too tough on yourself. But it's okay to be tough on yourself when it comes to the mental side. You know, just ramp up the volume of intensity there. Just, okay, that's what I want to be. I want to be confident, relentless, just as best as I possibly can. If my performance is down at three or four, if I give some balls away or I miss this or miss that or whatever it might be related to your sport, that's okay. My performance is down a bit, but my mentality, just keep that good. Uh, and I think that's a useful path to go down mm. it's a big question it's a big sure. question it's not always easy mm. so hope yeah. that answers it yeah a little bit. brilliant no thanks for for giving the insights there dan look that's been uh, an amazing hour plus i got more than i expected out of this and, and no we probably could talk, as i said talk for for a lot longer but respectful of your time um delighted to meet you delighted to talk with you i'm very excited to to share this one out i'll keep certainly following all the good stuff you're doing you have your own podcast as well sports psych show um and as i said i'll send you over some uh cheat sheets on how to uh to kind of up the game there through my learning and failing and all of that as well um your website dan just call that out before we we wrap up and any other ways people can get in touch danabrahams.com you can follow me on twitter i've actually got three twitter accounts but the main one is at dan abrahams 77 brilliant thanks so much dan have a, a great uh, rest of the evening looking forward to keeping connected thanks for your time rob thanks a lot man so this is the outro of the podcast guys you got to the end and that is great please hang in here for another couple of minutes i know most people won't but maybe there's something here of interest so check this out first off thanks so much for listening to this one as well as maybe the hundred or so that's gone before it why not check them out if you haven't already there's lots of good stuff in there the whole podcasting journey for me has been a huge learning and i'm trying to help you guys learn and improve as well so much has changed over the last few years since I started it. I've really realized lots of the goals that I put out there and then realized so many unexpected benefits as well. And I think anytime you take on 
action towards a goal, you're going to pick up lots of things that you didn't expect along the way. And hopefully they're good things. In this particular episode, was there any one or two things that jumped out? Maybe you could take a pen and paper out right now, because this is something that you might think of during the episode but never do. Do it now. Take it out. Write down a goal that you're going to set yourself as a result of something you learned from this episode. Put a plan in place and then work towards it, applying yourself deliberately over time. Take ownership, build a habit, improve, get 1% better, share accountability with somebody you know in a buddy system and learn and grow and improve. That's what it's all about. That's my hopefully inspirational piece done other areas to note check out the website robofthegreen.ie you can consume everything there for free there is obviously the podcast there's video one minute monday clips there's articles uh, not enough but i'd like to put more there if you're interested in putting one there let me know and there's a get better at page which i'm starting to add new content to over time there's a feedback page if you want to email me rob at rob of the instead but it's all about trying to engage you and get you to a place of improvement so i'm open to feedback as i said ways you can help me is by following me on the socials at rob of the is the website or at rob of the green on all the social platforms subscribe to the podcast on any of the apps that you might listen to it on talk about it tell a friend about it tell your family members about it share some of the ideas not only to your friends but to me is there anything i can improve upon sign up to the newsletter that's there as well i'm experimenting again with a group called slack rob of the green on slack this is really for a shared accountability environment and sharing ideas you can sign up to that on the website as well all of this is obviously all free but there is also an option where you could subscribe to my patreon site and make a small donation for the content that we do it's there it's totally up to you everything that is coming in through that or could come in through that will go into making the podcast better so to close i am always trying to improve and get better change is difficult i know that but it's all about taking the first step learning something applying yourself moving forward you can do this i've been able to improve pushing myself outside the comfort zone learning and i think if i can do it so can you don't overreach don't set yourself unrealistic goals one percent at a time is enough but it's all about starting and that will bring you on your pursuit of betterness to a great place. Thanks for sticking to the very end. Talk to you next time and take care. Good luck.